Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to tonight's session. I'm really pleased to say that tonight we're joined by my colleague, Professor Gareth Jenkins. Uh, Gareth this evening is going to be covering the topic of uh, blood tests for cancer. And we're gonna cover that session. And we've got about a 30 to 40 minute um, taster session um, with Professor Jenkins. Uh, you will then have an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So please do those that are joining us live, use that Q and A button at the bottom of the panel and you can ask questions questions and we'll come to as many of those as we can at the end. Those of you that are joining us on record, then if you do have specific questions, then you can email us and the email address to use is study at swansea.ac.uk and we'll do our very best to come back to you as soon as we possibly can. So the rest of the week as well, we do have um, quite a few sessions happening over the coming days and you can book for any of those sessions on our webinar series page Head Start and we'll make sure all of you get a link to that following tonight's session. Um, okay, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over um, to Professor Jenkins and he's going to kick off tonight's session on blood tests for cancer. Thanks, Emma. So now the tricky bit, can I get the screen share to work? Let's see. Fabulous. Top marks. <laughs> there. Can, is that, is that yep. okay for everybody? That's great, thank you. Okay, thanks Emma for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for, for coming this evening to, to listen to, to, to this mini lecture. So I've been asked to give you an overview of some of the molecular research that's, that, that I carry out particularly, but as an example of some of the research that's undertaken here on molecular aspects of different diseases in the medical school, soon to be the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences um, to get a, a feel for, for, for the kinds of uh, research that you would be exposed to should you choose to come and join us in, in October. So I'm going to talk about blood tests for cancer, something I'm personally really interested in. I'm going to talk a little bit about what they are and I'm going to ask a question, do they work as well? So uh, you already know this, um, so this shows how great Swansea University is and the the medical school in particular and um, you know this otherwise you wouldn't be considering coming to join us in in October so a little bit about me I thought it would be useful for you to get an idea of of who I am and why I'm sitting here talking to you on a Tuesday evening and um, so uh, as Emma introduced me at the beginning I'm Gareth Jenkins so I'm a professor of genetics I have been for 10 years or, or more here at Swansea Medical School and I'm really interested in cancer and in particularly in carcinogens how the chemicals that cause cancer work and in terms of cancer I'm particularly interested in how we can use early diagnosis to improve the survival rates of of patients who've got cancer. For my, um, for my sins I currently am the director of research for the medical school as well so this means that I have a um, managerial role in, in trying to coordinate the research activity across the medical school and to, to try and um, uh, coordinate the, the efforts that we're, we're all taking in different aspects of, um, of research and development. Uh, and so we try to closely link the research that's carried out in the laboratories and the offices and the data science um, laboratories uh, here in the medical school with our taught program so that the taught programs have a scattering of, of researchers coming to talk about state-of-the-art cutting-edge uh, research um, um, in, in, in all the modules. So I teach a third-year module to the undergraduate programs to genetics, biochemistry, applied medical science etc uh, and this is on cancer genetics which is something that I'm particularly interested in and I also take third year project students so as you probably are aware in the third year of the BSc programs there is a large research project most people carried a, a laboratory based research project and I, I usually have two um, students in my lab every year carrying out some some research as well as um, taking MSI students and um, students who are carrying out MSc projects as well. So this slide, I probably don't need to go through this slide, but I thought it was important to try and 
make the case for why early diagnosis is important. I'm sure you're all aware that this is a really important aspect of, of cancer in general. So it's true now that more than 50% of patients who were diagnosed with cancer survive on average, um, on average 50% survive for um, five years or more, which has increased steadily over the previous decades. And this has been a big achievement uh, in terms of improving the prognosis of the average cancer patient. Uh, but we could do better. And the way to make um, this survival data better is to catch cancer earlier. So the earlier the diagnosis, the better the prognosis, the more options that clinicians have, um, whether that be surgery or um, therapy, uh, that there, there's vital that the cancer is diagnosed early to maximize the, the effectiveness of the different treatments available. Another thing that's important when we think about early diagnosis is the concept of using biomarkers to be able to identify and diagnose cancers early. So biomarkers are biomolecules, biological molecules, who, which are expressed uh, in cancer tissue in particular and whose presence we can use as a surrogate for the presence of cancer. So if something is, is expressed at a high level in cancer and we see that same biomolecule in a patient who we don't know their, um, their, their, their diagnosis, then we can assume that there's a good chance that they've got cancer. So these biomarkers are really um, valuable in, in the early diagnostics world. And, and even, really good biomarkers, if we develop really powerful biomarkers that are very accurate at identifying patients who may have cancer, then they can be used in a screening um, mode to actually look in the general public. So instead of people who may be symptomatic, who may, may be attending hospital for some reason, uh, we can actually look in the general population as they're doing a Tesco shop to see if they, they have an elevation of a biomarker, which means they might need to go and get some further tests. So I use in particular um, DNA mutations as biomarkers of um, early cancer. And I thought I'd explain why that is the case. And the main reason is that cancer is really a disease of DNA mutations. And so DNA mutations drive cancer development. And so it's a natural thing to use the presence of DNA mutations as a biomarker for um, the presence of cancer. So our DNA is constantly mutating. Uh, this is the basis of, of evolution of life. And so we can't stop DNA mutating. So there's constant mutations occur, but it's the mutations that occur in key cancer causing genes that are of particular importance in the cancer context. And these mutations are induced spontaneously just by our natural everyday um, way of living but they are also induced by carcinogens, things that increase the level of those mutations. And good examples of those are cigarette smoke, uh, UV light and other dietary exposures. So cigarette smoke contains thousands of compounds which are carcinogens. Um, and in particular, there are hundreds of those compounds which are really potent carcinogens which cause mutations. And so the longer you have exposed to these uh, carcinogens, the greater your chance of developing cancer. So um, because mutations are so closely linked to the development of cancer, they are really good biomarkers usually for, for cancer in general. So I work on a type of cancer called esophageal adenocarcinoma. So I, I, I won't go through this in great detail. It's, a, it's a, unfortunately a, a cancer that's associated with poor survival. And so the graph here. I think you can see my mouse on the screen. This graph here from Cancer Research UK's website, they provide lots of really useful data around cancer information. This shows the, the survival rates of different types of cancer. At the top here is the average survival rate, which you'll, you'll see is 54% when you average all cancers. But there's a big disparity between different cancer types. And unfortunately, esophageal cancer is one of the poorer ones in terms of its survival rate with only 15% of patients surviving five years. Unfortunately, that means that 85% of those patients diagnosed with this form of cancer will die from their cancer in, in those five years. So for a long time, I've been interested in biomarkers that might help diagnose this kind of cancer earlier. And to begin with, this meant collecting tissues from, um, 
from hospital settings when people were having endoscopy where a tube is inserted uh, into the throat and down into the, the food pipe of the esophagus. Um, and this is a really useful way to, to, to uh, obtain tissue samples so you can study for the presence of these biomarkers. Uh, but the problem is this is quite an invasive procedure. It only gets carried out on a relatively small group of patients annually or biannually. And so the move to blood-based biomarkers opens the door to being able to look at a much wider group of patients because it's a, it's a, it's a much more, sorry, it's a much less invasive procedure getting a simple blood sample from a patient. And this idea that blood tests or blood samples could be used for diagnosis of cancer is, um, is, has been coined, the phrase has been coined, the liquid biopsy. And so instead of a tissue biopsy where you might obtain a bit of tissue, you can actually get a, a blood sample or in some cases a urine sample, this is also termed a liquid biopsy. And you can use that liquid, so in this case blood, to look for the presence of these biomarkers to manage patients who may uh, have cancer. And this is a much less invasive approach. And what people do in these, um, uh, with these liquid biopsies is measure all sorts of different things and assess whether any of them have any merit in, in, in operating as biomarkers. And so this can include DNA, this can include cell-based biomarkers. This is what I'm going to talk about, the presence of mutated cells in the blood as a biomarker of the presence of cancer. But it can be RNA, protein, lipid, or even metabolites. And probably in the future, the future suggests that it'll be combinations of some of these that will be most valuable. So this uh, picture up here in the top right hand corner is from a conference that's been newly organized in the last couple of years. The first was held in 2019, the year before the lockdown. And this is organized by the European Association for Cancer Research specifically on liquid biopsy. So it's become a real sub group of the cancer research field now, the, the, the promise of liquid biopsies. So liquid biopsies could be really powerful in the developed world in, in increasing our chance to detect cancer patients at an earlier stage. But I think personally that the, they're going to have an even bigger impact in the developing world where they don't have the infrastructure to do standard tissue-based tests so well. Um, and so it could be a really, because these tests using um, blood are much more rapid, they're lower cost, and you don't always need a lot of infrastructure. And um, they could help revolutionize cancer detection in, in developing countries. And so these images come from Dakar in Bangladesh. I do, I do a bit of work with um, some of my colleagues in Dakar uh, in Bangladesh, and they have um, unfortunately really high rates of different types of cancer, much higher than the developed world. And one of the reasons for this is they have widespread contamination of their water with arsenic, which as well as being a poison is actually a really potent carcinogen. And so in the developed, sorry, in the developing world, um, what we used to call the third world, um, the, 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 the use of, of blood-based biomarkers, rapid tests for cancer could be really important, um, even more so than perhaps in, in the developed world. So you may be asking how blood can act as, as this source of these biomarkers. And the reason why blood is really good for, for looking for these different um, biological molecules is that tumours are bathed in blood constantly. So tumours can't develop without a blood supply. Um, it's an absolutely fundamental thing they need to do is to develop a blood supply. And they constantly are bathed in blood, which is pumped through the tumour. And so this blood that's pumping through the tumour picks up all kinds of discarded molecules and cells from the tumour. Um, and th these are the things that can be detected when you take a blood sample from, from the arm or from a finger prick um, in someone's finger. But what we're particularly interested in is the chemicals that are secreted by the tumour. So in this picture here in the left, you see the tumour here with a blood supply running through it. It discards all sorts of different things in circulating tumor cells being some of them which release DNA, but it can, it can secrete all kinds of chemicals. And these chemicals can damage the cells in the blood and cause secondary mutations. So the chemicals pumped out of 
of tumors can sometimes be reactive and noxious compounds. They can be um, uh, really reactive chemicals in their own right, produced by this bubbling cauldron of the tumor. And these can cause mutations in the blood cells around them. So uh, this, is, this is one of the, 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 the things that we, we focus on in, in, in my research group. So we use this non-invasive approach to collect a blood sample and measure the presence of these secondary mutations. So I'm going to talk about two different approaches that we use. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. This is way beyond um, um, what you would have you would have been um, covering in, in, in an A-level syllabus. This is something that you will find out more and more about during a degree level um, education. But I'm going, to, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. So one of the tests that we study has got a long name. It's called the phosphatidylinositol glycan synthase A gene, shortened to the pig A um, mutation test. And this basically measures mutations present in red blood cells. And in this picture here, it's just a simple um, visualization of what the test looks for. And basically, this is a normal cell. So a normal cell has these cell surface markers on them. And these cell surface markers we can easily detect with a fluorescent antibody, which is raised to uh, bind to those markers. And so this is a normal wild type cell with the fluorescent markers, sorry, the fluorescent antibodies binding to these cell surface markers. The mutation that occurs in this phosphatidyl and oxidol glycan synthase A gene knocks out the presence of these cell surface markers. And so you get these naked cells that don't have these particular markers present. And so the the cells, the red blood cells, don't have fluorescent antibodies attached to them. So you can assess the rare number of mutations by counting the, the number of cells which have lost the presence of these cell surface markers. And we do this using flow cytometry, which you may have heard about, but uh, you don't, don't need to worry about it. Essentially, it's a, it's a method for analyzing millions of cells in a short period of time. They flow through a chamber, a laser is fired at the flow tube and each cell is interrogated as it flows past to ask the question, is it fluorescent? Does it fluoresce um, with the particular fluorescent antibody that we've added? And so in this graph here, here are the normal cells. These give highly fluorescent images or highly fluorescent readouts. Each one of these dots is an individual cell and there are millions of cells in this plot. It's saturated here because there's so many cells on top of each other. These are the normal highly fluorescent cells as shown here. And then what we're interested in is these rare mutated cells here, which, have, which are naked because they've picked up this particular mutation. And you get a very small number of these, these mutated cells. And in this case, this is a healthy volunteer sample. There were three mutated cells in a million normal cells. So this flow cytometry approach allows you to analyze millions of cells in one, in one run. And so we wanted to ask quite a simple question. So we thought that the secondary mutations that could be induced by tumors would mean we might see more of these mutated cells in a cancer patient compared to a healthy volunteer patient. And so we carried out a study to answer that question. So this study was carried out by someone who works in my research group. I thought it would be worth highlighting her. So this is Dr. Rachel Lawrence here. And I thought it was interesting because it, a few years ago, she was sitting in your shoes because she was a, uh, an applicant to Swansea University to come and study genetics with us. Uh, she completed her genetics degree and got a first. She then carried out a PhD in my research group working on some of these blood-based uh, biomarker um, approaches. And she now works as a postdoctoral scientist in, in my group. And this is a paper that we published recently. And there was some uh, publicity picked up by the national um, news and TV and, and newspaper articles a few years ago when, when, the, when they got quite excited about this approach. So in essence, all of that work, um, a large part of Rachel's PhD, in fact, comes down to this one graph. Uh, and so it, essentially, it shows that the cancer patients have a lot more of these mutated cells compared to the healthy controls or other patients who have, um, who don't have cancer, but have a disease of the esophagus, which is associated with a future, a potential future development of cancer. And so essentially the, the answer to, the, to our question was, was yes, the, the secondary mutations 
are higher in cancer patients than in non-cancer patients. And so this offers the possibility that this kind of approach could in theory um, diagnose an, un, an undiagnosed patient, that if a patient comes in and has a blood test um, taken, a blood sample taken, and in this particular test for the presence of these mutations carried out, and if the patient has a mutation level which is up around here somewhere, they're much more likely to be a cancer patient than a non-cancer patient. And equally, if a patient comes in and has a low level of mutations around here, it's unlikely that they are a cancer patient, that they have cancer. So this kind of approach could, in theory, if validated, um, be a, a way of diagnosing a, a cancer patient from a, from a, from, from a non-cancer patient. But I think what's more important, again, is that um, this also allows us to investigate some of the things that cause mutations in our bodies in general. So if we take the non-cancer patients from the previous graph and we ask questions, well, you know, with these you know, 150 or so patients, how can we, um, uh, can we find some, some exposures, some characteristics which are associated with having a higher level of mutation? So these aren't cancer patients now. These are in large part normal, healthy um, people who, 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 um, who aren't um, currently ex ex experiencing having cancer. And so this is a really useful group of patients to ask questions about their exposures and the link to mutation in general. Remember, mutation drives future cancer development. So this data shows that you know, older people have more of these mutations. That's what we would expect. Um, longer you live, the more you're exposed to carcinogens. Your ability to defend yourself against DNA mutations is probably a bit lower when you're older. So this, this fits with what we would expect. There was a, 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 a weak association with obesity, but maybe there is something in the obesity side of things as well. Smoking caused more mutations. So smokers had more mutations than non-mutations, uh, sorry, the non-smokers. And as I said to you earlier, that's probably because cigarette smoke contains thousands of reactive compounds and many, many um, really potent carcinogens. And even some of the drugs that we take uh, influence this. And so people who took aspirin regularly had a lower level of mutation. So this was a protective um, factor uh, against mutation induction in general. So remember, this is not cancer patients. This is just asking a question about which of the patients and volunteers had mutations and what factors influence whether they had mutations or not. So we can understand human mutation through this kind of approach. So there's, you know, that's one particular um, approach that we use to study these secondary mutations, but there are several others. I'm going to show you very briefly this data. It's going to be a couple of slides and then I'll be finishing. Um, so this is a different approach which measures, measures a completely different type of mutation uh, in a different cell type as well. So this is measured in lymphocytes, in white blood cells, uh, and this measures a chromosomal level mutation. So instead of being a, a mutation in a single gene, which has a, a, a knockout of a phenotype, which we can measure with flow cytometry, this actually is a, um, uh, a, a chromosomal level mutation in the DNA, uh, a fragmentation event usually. So you form these small DNA containing bodies in the cytoplasm of cells. So these small nuclei or micronuclei as they've been dubbed, uh, show the presence of a chromosomal mutation. And we can measure the presence of these in lymphocytes using automated um, mic microscope systems like the ones we have in, 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 in my lab here in, uh, in the medical school. And we can ask the same question, can, can this kind of chromosomal level mutation uh, separate cancer patients from non-cancer patients and um, cutting to the chase the answer is yes you get the same pattern with cancer patients here esophageal adenocarcinoma these patients have many more of these mutations these chromosomal mutations than the patients with this pre-cancerous condition barrett esophagus reflux disease or the healthy volunteers and so both of those both of those approaches show the same thing that these secondary mutations induced in blood cells by the tumour um, are elevated in cancer patients compared to non-cancer patients. And so in theory, this is a promising starting point to ask the question, could this be a clinically useful uh, way of identifying cancer patients at an, earlier, at an earlier stage? 
So a summary, so a, so a take home message, I, whenever I um, give lectures or talks at conferences, I always try to, to give people a, a take home message to something that they can remember when they're sitting in the bar later. Uh, so hopefully I've been able to convince you that early diagnosis is really important. It's the most important um, thing we should focus on in cancer research because it'll have the biggest impact on prognosis. And hopefully I've been able to convince you that blood tests or liquid biopsies are really promising because of their non-invasive nature and are um, a really exciting way that will revolutionize cancer detection and cancer management in the coming years. I've shown you a little bit of data uh, from our research group around secondary DNA mutations, and this looks promising to us at the moment. But our data and data being generated by other laboratories needs validation before it can be clinically applied, because um, to be clinically apl applied, it has to go through lots of, um, lots of different processes to, 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 to make sure that it, is, it performs uh, reproducibly and is, 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 is accurately identifying the, the cancer patients. And so this is something that I teach in the, the cancer genetics module that I run to third year BSc students in the medical school. Um, but there are other um, equally exciting areas of research that are carried out within the medical school, which are taught in the other um, BSc and MSc programs. And uh, I will finish and thank you for listening. And I'll leave you with, the, as if you didn't know, um, because you obviously have tuned in today because you are aware of the courses on offer within the medical school. Um, and uh, just to flag up at the top here that there is an undergraduate open day on the 8th of May. Uh, and I will finish there and I'm happy to take any questions if anyone's got any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Gareth. Really informative. So just before um, we come on to the to the live Q&A, and I know we'll, I'm sure we'll have some questions from those joining us live. Um, I'm just going to end the recording. And just to remind those of you that are watching this on record, if you do have any questions for us, then you can use that email address, which is study at Swansea dot ac dot uk and we'll do our very best to get back to you as soon as we possible can possibly can thank you for watching and get back in touch with us with any questions